Hello, everyone, and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Hal Avinka, and I'm the event director at the bookstore, and I'm absolutely thrilled today to be collaborating again with our friends at the New York Review of Books for the second entry in our panel series. Uh, tonight's topic, Journalism in a Time of Crisis, featuring Justine Vanderloon, Howard French, Elizabeth Brunig, and Mark Danner, and moderated by Daryl Pinckney. While the pandemic has taken a toll across all of our lives, Virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become bright spots in our days. And I wanna give a huge thanks to our panelists for joining us this evening. Uh, so to a little housekeeping, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button here at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We'll try to get through as many of those as we can at the end of the program. There's also a chat button here at the bottom through which I'll be posting a link to a special NYRB subscription offer for all of tonight's attendees. Uh, a caveat for tonight's event and for all virtual events, we are all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads. So please bear with any technical issues that could arise. We'll try to solve them quickly. And finally, we've scheduled a whole host of spring programming. So head over to our website and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. Uh, two that I wanna point out, First, our panel series with NYRB will pick back up on Tuesday, April 20th with Fiction in a Time of Crisis, featuring Valeria Luiselli, Ben Lerner, Ayad Akhtar, and others. Uh, and second, our NYRB Poets series resumes tomorrow evening, welcoming Najwan Darwish for the release of his newest collection, Exhausted on the Cross. Uh, again, you can learn more about our, our events by signing up for our newsletter or registering to our, uh, at our website. Uh, and finally, I want to give a special thanks to Daniel Mendelson for helping coordinate tonight's program. So now just a little bit about tonight's guest and we will get started. Justine Vanderloon is a independent journalist and author and a fellow at Type Media Center. Her most recent book is We Are Not Such Things, The Murder of a Young American, A South African Township and the Search for Truth and Reconciliation. She is the recipient of reporting grants from the Pulitzer Center, Type Investigations and the International Women's Media Foundation and has been awarded fellowships by PEN America's Writing for Justice Program and the Sustainable Arts Foundation. Howard W. French is a career foreign correspondent and global affairs writer and the author of four books, including three works of nonfiction and a work of documentary photography. His most recent nonfiction book, Everything Under the Heavens, How the Past Helped Shape China's Push for Global Power, was published by Knopf in 2017 and was widely reviewed and featured by The Guardian and other publications as one of its notable books of the season. Elizabeth Brunig is a New York Times opinion writer who has published original reporting on the Catholic Church, America's struggle to respond to the coronavirus, Bernie Sanders 2020 primary campaign, the Trump administration's resumption of federal executions and much more. Previously, she has written and edited for the New Republic and the Washington Post where she won several awards and was a finalist for the 2019 Pulitzer Prize in feature writing for her feature, What Do We Owe Her Now? Mark Danner is a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books and a former staff writer at The New Yorker and has covered foreign affairs and politics for three decades. He is the author of The Massacre at El Mazote, uh, Torture and Truth, Stripped, Stripping Bear the Body, and Spiral, Trapped in the Forever War, among other books. His work has been honored with a National Magazine Award, three Overseas Press Awards, a Guggenheim, and an Andrew Carnegie Fellowship, and an Emmy. Uh, in 1999, he was named a MacArthur Fellow. And Daryl Pinckney is the author of two novels, High Cotton and Black Deutschland, and three works of nonfiction out there, Mavericks of Black Literature, Blackballed, The Black Vote in U.S. Democracy, and Busted in New York, and other essays. So, Daryl, I'm turning things over to you. Oh, all right. Uh, good evening. In 1976, the British journalist uh, John Swain was taken captive by rebels in Eritrea. He expected the Sunday Times of London to make an announcement which for various reasons the paper didn't do, he waited. After a month, the Sunday Times did make his disappearance public. Swain had with him a small transistor radio and a small tape recorder. He'd conserved his batteries and was able to record the BBC World Service report on his having gone missing. He played it for his captors, who at last believed he was what he'd been saying he was. He was who he said he was, he was released. In 1999, Swain was in East Timor and, what, and went into what turned out to be a war zone. His driver and translator were abducted by anti-independence militia. Swain and a photographer fled into the jungle. While in hiding, Swain phoned the Sunday Times and people there immediately got in touch with the Australian High Command in Australia that was in charge of the military operation. And within minutes, dispatched a helicopter to rescue them. They pinpointed their location with the help of heat seeking devices. The difference between Swain's capture in Eritrea and his flight into the jungle was finally his having a flip phone, a mobile phone. 
from the electric typewriter to the word processor to the computer, the web, the internet, and technological change strikes us in journalism as even faster now, uh, deeper. Nicholas Lehman published a provocative essay in the February 27th, 2020 issue of the New York Review of Books, Can Journalism Be Saved? Made rather doer predictions about the place and practice of the kind of uh, serious journalism that the brilliant writers on this panel are very much associated with. Elizabeth Bruning, Mark Danner, Howard French, Justin Van Der Lue. The market has no chance of fixing reporting with a public mission, Lehman said. Journalism about matters of public importance either can't be essential or it needs more reliable support system because in most instances, its sources of commercial revenue have collapsed, he added. Newspapers had gone the way of selling not just news to readers, but readers to advertisers, said Guardian editor Alan Rusbridger, whom Lehman saluted for having successfully navigated a broadsheet newspaper into internet life. Published on the eve of lockdown, Lehman's essay conveyed the old wariness of internet technology that had been with us and some of us for a long time because the internet made or threatened to make long established outlets and models of news distribution and news analysis obsolete. But now we are in a world changed by the pandemic and it's odd what can sound pre-pandemic even an essay published only a year ago. Maybe one of the shifts in attitude that the pandemic has caused has been to make an individual's, con an individual's contact with the outside world primarily dependent on the internet. Negotiations and processes of professional life, daily life, are largely performed over the internet. It is the bringer of alternative media, except in India, where print remains the dominant media India has over 100,000 newspapers and periodicals, but the internet is also the bringer of the mainstream. At the same time, two of the oppositions Lehman described within contemporary journalism, professional journalism and citizen journalism, original reporting and comment on information available to everybody have become more urgent because of the internet and its prevalence making the ethical, moral, and political considerations once again a motive that challenges the bottom line. The Washington Post and the New York Times became ever more militant day by day under the previous administration. The New York Times recently reported an increase in subscriptions and profits, even as print subscriptions and advertisement continue to decline. The business is truth. Professional news sources have somehow survived the end of their near monopoly status and in some cases have adapted or have they? We tell ourselves that this year of global pandemic, global protests and political violence has been one of profound change. The works of Elizabeth Bruni, Mark Danner, Howard French and Justine van der Loon share a sense of intense commitment of immersion in the material or scene Journalists work under difficult circumstances. And so I wanted to begin by asking each panelist to talk about how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected his or her work, what you are doing, how you do it, what you had planned to do. So may I begin with Elizabeth Bruning, who's a generation that grew up with the internet uh, and who writes about people trying to cope with the pandemic or who have found a new sense of purpose in the pandemic. Uh, so may we start with you and ask you about the effects this has had on the way you work or the work you're doing? Yeah, the, I mean, the, the immediate effect was that we couldn't travel and uh, we couldn't sit down with people. And uh, I was traveling when the pandemic restrictions began. I was backstage with Bernie in Detroit right before Super Tuesday. And um, by the time I got back, you know, the world had kind of shifted. Um, and, you know, it, it makes writing well difficult if you don't have scenes if you can't see people and you can't observe events happening and you're just interviewing over the phone or over zoom and you're not on the ground that stuff is useful it's important um but it, it's hard to call it beautiful um and so that was uh sort of the thing that hit me instantly is i'm gonna have to figure out a different way to do this uh, craft all together. And so there, um, there was quite a bit of uh, figuring out how to get these 
you know, sort of human elements on the page, what people are going through emotionally when you can't be with them was really difficult. Um, a lot of it came down to me asking a lot of people to send me pictures of themselves. I, I started asking people who were doing sort of interesting things like monks who were working in a COVID uh, ward in New York City. Um, I asked them to take pictures all day long and send me all the pictures, selfies, everything they saw, their faces when they got up, things that interested them during the day. Take a hundred pictures while you're bored and waiting. Just show me. I've had some success with guys in the military doing that as well. Um, but it's it's hard to beat being with people on the ground. And I, I had COVID-19. I got sick uh, pretty much right off the bat. My husband and I and our kids got sick. Everybody was fine. I was not even 30 at the time. My husband was fine. I was fine. We were both kind of run down for a week. The kids were barely symptomatic at all, the runny nose. Uh, the pediatrician told us uh, parents and young children get coronaviruses all the time. Your immune system is primed to deal with it. Um, and so for my purposes, I knew that I likely could not get it again. Then it was just a matter of making sure other people felt safe and comfortable and trying to understand what was the likelihood that someone with a degree of immunity could transmit it. Um, and if people were willing to take the risk with me or if the risk was you know, purely mine, then I was willing to travel. And I, I have traveled and I have sat down with people to the degree that they're comfortable with just because I find it's a really irreplaceable part of what we do. Um, so I was, I traveled as recently as December um, and, and, and we'll be doing that again in the spring. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a risk, uh, you know, it, uh, to some degree. And it's certainly not a universalizable thing, right? Because not everybody is protected against the virus. Not everybody does feel comfortable incurring that level of risk. Um, but for me, that was, you know, something that I, I just couldn't get, uh, couldn't get away from, couldn't stop doing comfortably. So, uh, yeah. I remember the photograph of the Dominican talking about his fear in the ward uh, and what the church teaches him that it's not the end of life, but the change life. The photograph is very striking. And their, their um, situation was so difficult because the touching of people and like kissing and being close is such a such an important part of the I mean, sacrament. Yeah. So. Um, Mark Danner, um, uh, in your um, very sort of evocative uh, piece on uh, being with the crowd storming the Capitol on January 6th, um, I noticed that you sort of said that you're wearing the mask and everyone around you isn't. You were very kind of uncomfortable, um, but it doesn't seem uncomfortable just because um, they're around not wearing them, but somehow it marked you out because you did have one. And so maybe your camouflage or your undercoverness in the crowd was slightly blown. Um, um, like um, Ms. Bruning, you, you go out to the stories um, that you're interested in. Um, have you found a similar kind of uh, sealed up problem that she has had to face? Yeah, I think very similar to what Elizabeth said um, during the run up to uh, uh, the election, um, I really felt I had covered each presidential back to before 2000 and I wanted to cover it um, and it was, a little soul searching went into it because I have also have a couple of small children and um, I knew that the the real scene to cover was the Trump campaign, you know. Um, and I knew that though I could wear a mask um, that most people wouldn't be wearing them. And, you know, I anticipated this and just decided well, I was gonna do it. I would come back, I would get a test. I would be as careful as one could, but it wasn't quite, uh, like what I expected. I mean, you arrive after, I think the first rally I went to was in September uh, in Michigan, and you arrive after uh, having been mostly inside and not in any crowds uh, for six months, and suddenly you're in an aircraft hangar with 
15,000 people who are pushed together tighter than a rock concert. You know, your elbows are pinned against the, your sides and you have people screaming into your face from next to you from a few inches away. And as you said, Daryl, I mean, I was wearing a mask and I'd say perhaps 10%, 5% people were wearing masks and they were kind of two different sorts of paranoia. Uh, the first level of paranoia was I started to feel that I was seeing little bits of virus floating above the crowd. They were like little black dots. It affected me in kind of a physical way that I hadn't at all anticipated. This really paranoid feeling that I was in this mass of virus just above this extremely tight crowd. You know, you stand there for four hours, you can't go to the bathroom, you can't get a drink, you can't move essentially. So there was that level of paranoia. And then there's a secondary level which comes from wearing the mask and being surrounded by people who aren't wearing one. And when you talk to them, which is what you're there to do, uh, you get a look back that may or may not suggest that you're either an outsider or in their terms, a pussy, you know, that you're there wearing a mask. And why are you wearing a mask? Because wearing a mask in that crowd declares your political preferences in some way, uh, and indeed your manhood in some way. Um, I was very aware that uh, while of the people who were masked, that most of them seemed to be women rather than men, which was another weird observation. Um, so this whole mask dichotomy between those who are masked and those who aren't was completely new to me. I live in Berkeley, California. You know, everybody is very dutiful, what my friend calls COVID kosher. They all, you know, wear masks assiduously. Uh, so being in this crowd was a shock. I mean, what you were referring to was a mention I made in a piece about the actual capital coup or the stupid coup, as I called it. Um, and, uh, you know, the percentage who are wearing masks there, I think, was even lower. Um, uh, and I felt definitely sort of standing out in wearing, uh, in wearing my mask. Um, uh, but nonetheless, I, like Elizabeth, really felt I wanted... I had to be there, particularly for the coup, which is remarkable. You know, I told people in the days before when I was traveling to Washington, why are you going to Washington? Well, I'm going to cover the coup. And now we have this controversy over whether people could have known about it or not. But of course, everybody, in fact, who was paying attention on the internet uh, did know about it. Um, I, I, I guess something I'd add here is that journalism in the time of crisis, such an interesting uh, uh, notion, because not only is there this pandemic, uh, which has changed so much of how we behave uh, and how we look at the world and how we associate with people and how we live our lives, but there are, of course, these other crises that seem to lie under uh, this one, like layers of a layer cake, you know, and, and uh, one of them is uh, obviously the social justice, racial justice crisis that was really set off uh, with uh, the killing of, of George Floyd in its current form. And then there is a much larger, it seems to me, crisis that you touched on in your eloquent introduction, the crisis of legitimacy, uh, which now we see in a small way when it comes to the crisis of legitimacy of the current government, uh, because half the country believes that they stole the election to get in power, but a much larger crisis of legitimacy that brought us Trump and that, you know, is very much uh, must be brought into play when we talk about the current news media, uh, that these institutional sources of informational power have been delegitimized. Uh, and that is... Without that happening, you never would have had a President Donald Trump uh, without those sources of information being delegitimized and without these other institutions like the political parties be de being delegitimized. So that there is, it seems to me, a kind of decadence over our, not just our information institutions, but our political institutions. And I think when we talk about doing journalism in a time of crisis, 
if we're looking at the phenomenon of Donald Trump and now covering uh, the Biden administration, uh, we have to look at this delegitimization um, because it is just everywhere around us. Um, and I guess that's how I would, I would conclude. Right. Uh, yes, I, I think that's very important. And um, we'll certainly come right back to that um, after we talk to Howard French and Justine Vendelin, but you're absolutely right about that. How that has happened or why uh, is something I'd be interested in hearing uh, what you think about, um, uh, especially in connection as a reaction to uh, the social justice uh, movement, really, uh, which has been going on for a long time or gaining mm -hmm. ground for a long time. Um, um, but uh, Howard French, um, I mean, you write a kind of, what should I say, witness research and travel or these distant places have been very um, much what you do. Um, um, in the pandemic, um, you have something coming out all, uh, soon on uh, Africa. I assume this sort of from work done before uh, the pandemic. But now, um, um, I understand you're writing about kind of the um, American leadership or loss of it. And um, certainly the uh, Trump lack of response to the coronavirus uh, figures in this story, um, perhaps, or maybe not. I didn't um, well, well, start talking anyway. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If, uh, <laughs> um, first, first of all, I, I I would like to sort of draw a, a contrast with Elizabeth. I was fortunately never got sick with COVID. Um, uh, I, um, uh, but that it came at a very steep cost. So, as you rightly said, I've spent most of my life moving around quite a bit, and uh, generally outside of this country and far and wide. Um, uh, and was in the midst of uh, an accelerating process of reportage for the book that you just alluded to, which is coming out in the fall, and which is about Africa's role in the creation of the modern world. And I have been traveling to many different parts life. of the world, at least four different continents up until the COVID's outbreak. Um, and then boom, came COVID. Um, and uh, since then, I have been, you know, it forced me midstream to completely revise the approach to this book from one that would be heavily based, not, I mean, certainly lots of scholarly research and, and archival research, but nonetheless, in the way the story was told, heavily based on reportage to one, much less so, uh, because uh, um, it just struck me as being simply impossible. You know, last January, I was in Brazil and then went to Toronto for a very important museum show and then went to my, the, the last time I, the, the last time I did something remotely adventurous was right here in um, uh, Manhattan. I went to a concert at the Met by a West African uh, musician named Baba Mal, which was on March 9th. And I remember the palpable sense on March 9th of last year that COVID people, although not everyone was yet convinced of it. COVID was about to grab us by the throat here in this city. Um, and since that moment, I have been uh, really confined to a kind of postage stamp uh, area of real estate here on the Upper West Side. I have gone, I have, I, on my bicycle, I've left Manhattan a few times, um, but that's the furthest I've ventured uh, from home. Um, and um, I have, uh, as I said, had to, to to rethink my approach to my book. I'm I'm, I'm happy with my decision. I, I, I'm not happy to have been constrained the way I've been constrained, but I'm happy with the way things worked out given the constraints. Um, and I've had to learn a lot in terms of approaches to writing and approaches to thinking about writing books um, forced upon me by this crisis. Um, uh, in my, thankfully, I've had this book project because I'm you know, steeped in reporting. I've spent all my decades as a journalist, as a, as a real reporter. Um, and if I hadn't had a book project underway, not being able, uh, I'm a little bit older than Elizabeth. I have preconditions. Um, and so not feeling safe to sort of, not as brave as Mark wanting to sort of go out into the crowds um, so heedlessly as he did. Um, you know, if I hadn't had a book project, uh, really well underway when all of this happened, I probably would have lost my mind. I mean, what would I have been left with? I not not feeling safe enough to go out and report, um, and 
and nothing left to do. Well, so, but as it turns out, I've had the book and, and I've sort of re reverted is the wrong verb because this was never my, has never been my principal identity, but I've sort of invested a lot in commentary during this year because commentary is of course, it may not always be the best way to write about it. Um, it, it may not be that commentary without on the ground reportage is always the best kind of commentary, but you can do commentary without uh, you know, field work um, uh, in, a, in a moment to moment sense anyway. Um, so I've had those two things, the book project and, and, and commentary. And um, recently I got uh, the second of my two vaccines and um, I've given myself a kind of threshold date after which I'm gonna go running. At, uh, into the world um, like like a wild man. I mean, the people who are closest to me have no idea even how how, how much energy I'm about to unleash. Um, and that's really about to happen. So I can announce to you guys now that, you know, sometime in mid, mid, mid March ish, um, I'm about to undergo a big tran transition, if you will, uh, into or, or reversion to form. Um, I, I want to come back to um, uh, some of the things Mark was saying about um, uh, the undermining of the institutions and the decadence of the time. And I largely agree with the thrust and spirit of what you said, Mark. Um, uh, and there was certainly a, a war in institutions and one of the institutions, there has been a war in institutions and one of the institutions has been, of course, the media, the press and its place in society. Uh, and there are plentiful reasons to, to be seriously concerned about that, even after Trump, um, about the um, implications of not having a more or less commonly shared understanding of what reality is in a country. Um, that's, that, that, that definitely brings dangers, and I don't know how this is gonna work out. Um, but on the other hand, I think we would be remiss not to recognize Listen, I'm someone who says this having spent uh, an entire career at the New York Times as a reporter. So working for kind of the mainstay of the mainstays, right? Uh, I think we would be remiss not also, however, to recognize that there has been an extraordinary democratization of information um, uh, over the last generation or so that uh, with all of these perils has also brought a lot of positives. Um, it has made information much more accessible to people who were put off by institutions like the New York Times or, or the, the, the official media. Um, uh, it has made you, uh, Daryl, I think you invoked citizen reporters. One of somebody previously mentioned citizen reporters. It has given way to opened up space for all kinds of new news gathering, commentary, um, opinion, reportage, uh, and communication of ideas uh, between some of which are dangerous. We should just, you know, posit that right out front. But, but I, 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 for one, wouldn't want to go back to the old days when, you know, uh, we had two or three newspapers. We had the nightly news on the networks, uh, and very little outside of that. Um, and so I think, you know, as we try to make sense of, of journalism. In the, the age of crisis, we have to think in terms of a very active balance sheet where we have, you know, clear the clear perils, but um, not often enough discussed positives or at least potential positives uh, that come from what I've called uh, this opening up or dem democratization. Um, I think I'll I'll conclude with that. That's a good point, and uh, I'd like to also uh, return to that in the discussion. Uh, but for the moment now, I want to ask Justine van der Linde, uh, in your work, sometimes you seem to find the stories where you happen to be, a story um, beckons you or where you are, brings out a story you didn't know was there. Um, how has the pandemic uh, affected the way you work, what you're thinking about working on? A, I remember, um, uh, comes to mind very quickly, this very intense piece you did on the vulnerability of uh, incarcerated women to, um, um, COVID-19, uh, this kind of thing. Um, so how have you been moving through or trying to um, sense lockdown? Um, yeah, I, I think it's, I, I seem to be in a sort of different space than uh, everyone else here in the sense that 
Um, certainly I have done my share of, of traveling for reporting and um, tons of immersive, uh, you know, years spent just with somebody in Cape Town. But in a way I was sort of grounded <laughs> um, before the pandemic hit by motherhood of two young children. And I became really interested in what is my current sort of beat, which is um, women in mass incarceration and issues of the criminal legal system. Um, and I had been conducting, I had started conducting a nationwide kind of data gathering project because even before the pandemic, people in prisons are not interviewable. I mean, unless you really want to commit some kind of crime where you're gonna go to prison, which I think would even be difficult to, to do, um, you can't do immersion journalism in prisons. And I think my last, you know, similarly I've been, you know, my last reporting was like March 11th. And I, I did, I was, I was interviewing someone at um, Bedford Hills maximum security prison. And I had a, a similar experience to Mark. I, I could see the virus in that prison. And I really knew right then sitting there in that room where there were no precautions, where like everyone was hysterical in the outside world. And I walked into the prison and it was just as though it didn't exist at all. Um, so I, I knew that COVID was really going to hit hard. Um, but I had already been developing a kind of interviewing technique that did not involve needing to be in person with people. I was, I wanted to find a way to collect these really suppressed voices. And the way that you do that with people in prison largely is through writing. So quite strangely, the situation we all found ourselves in, which is cut off from the rest of the world, you know, confined to our small spaces. Of course, our apartments are not comparable to American prison cells, but the, 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 the sense of being cut off and only able to communicate um, virtually or through the written word was already something that I was doing. And, that, and I was already um, finding ways to get to know people through alternate approaches to interviewing. Um, so I didn't actually have that experience. Yes, I haven't been able to interview people in person. Prisons have been closed. There have been people I wanted to profile. But for the most part, um, I almost felt like my methods were kind of paralleling their experiences. It was, I, I, could, I could understand better what these people were living through. Um, and, and what it is to not be able to, you know, have that freedom. Um, and I also found sort of strangely, or maybe not strangely, maybe it makes a lot of sense because I think Daryl in the virtual green room, you were saying, has this been kind of, has this pandemic in a way been good for journalism? Um, has it, you know, there's the layer cake, has the pandemic in a way kind of exposed the, the rotten layer that journalists and social justice journalists have been saying is there and other people have been just being like, let's, the frosting is nice, you know? And suddenly everyone sees that and, and wants to, you know, because it's now affecting us all and we're, we're taking stock of what is this country really? I mean, I think Daryl, you're also saying something about do we know America? Like, and you know, did we ever really know it? Are we starting to get to know it now? And is that meeting a, a difficult and traumatic one? Um, and so I found that these issues that I was working on, which were quite niche and kind of radical and had to do with abolition and had to do with insti with sort of these other institutions like the police and the prison that that I don't consider legitimate, but that were previously held up as legitimate, you know, people were questioning those, especially with the protests. And so for my kind of quite niche topic there, which, which had very little interest for the year or so that I was focusing on it coming up to this pandemic, I mean, never have I had less success pitching as a freelancer, something that I knew was really important. It, it was almost like, and I was just coming up against total resistance, 
after the pandemic hit and as the protests happened, as abolition came on from this weird leftist thing to like the front page of the New York Times, Mariam Kaba is making, uh, yes, we need defund the police. My topics found a home quite easily in a, in a totally new way. So I'll, I'll end that there, but yeah, it's an yeah. alternative experience, I think. Well, these are, I think maybe uh, talking about the, what uh, Howard meant by the democratization of information. Now there's a need to know more about what had been in the margins or on the fringe. And so uh, that's coming in. Um, I think of Trump and uh, the pandemic as this kind of occupation. Uh, uh, and uh, it's very heartening to hear um, these writers speak of the need to make contact, these sort of human stories to communicate. Um, but I, I sort of wonder if everything that's happened doesn't in some ways uh, bring into question um, an important pillar of the legitimacy of journalism in America, which is this kind of um, uh, uh, free speech or the neutrality of free speech as an idea or the uh, 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 innate libertarian view we have of uh, the journalism profession. Um, um, uh, now that there are all these other sort of uh, competing and mad voices, um, are we really so, um, um, can the kind of uh, journalism we're for combat or even address this or should it? I mean, is it a kind of force of defense of free values, liberal values? Um, what is sort of free speech now, especially with uh, Twitter and Facebook sort of facing um, all these questions? I, I, I think that uh, all of you do a sort of advocacy journalism, even if it's not overt. Um, uh, uh, and this seems to be, uh, to be the direction to go in more and more uh, because um, uh, it's the only way to sort of understand uh, what's happening um, is that information has to always have a context uh, to protect it or to restore uh, its legitimacy in some ways. Um, um, but this sort of, um, I don't know, I don't think there's parity of right and left, but, but uh, um, what is now uh, the free speech moment uh, in your view? Where should the argument go? Uh, um, are we policing or should we police uh, political opinions or political expression, given how dangerous uh, some of it seems to be? We were talking before about um, trying to, I, I, I tried to listen to serious podcasts explaining QAnon and I couldn't do it. I almost don't want to know what they think. It's so uh, horrifying in a way. Um, but it goes to what we're talking about sort of, I feel like such a fool. All my life I thought I understood or knew. Uh, and these last four years I find I don't know white America at all. Um, um, sometimes the only place I feel safe is reading, um, is a reading. Uh, so where are you? Uh, did that make any sense or lead to <laughs> any thoughts that you might have? Um, <laughs> Sorry, but anyway, I'll I'll, I'll, okay. I'll start that. I, I, you know, I think the um, uh, democratization of information is a, is a, a beautiful idea, um, and I completely agree with Howard that it's important to uh, emphasize that this phenomenon has had a lot of strong and positive effects. Um, but I also think that our you know, the rule-based order of information, if you want to call it that, and I'm not going back to Walter Cronkite, but, you know, say 20 years ago, um, had certain advantages. The gatekeeper function meant that there was some definition for what a fact meant. Um, you know, QAnon as a national phenomenon would not have been possible 20 years ago. That doesn't mean there weren't paranoid conspiracy theories. It just means they weren't democratized to that extent. I mean, you can look at Hofstetter's paranoid, paranoid style in American politics, written, I think, in 62. And the phenomenon, you know, it, it is very helpful in understanding QAnon. 
but the the fantasies he were, was talking about did not encompass 30 million people. Um, so this kind of definition of what a fact was and what information uh, test and information had to go through to be considered credible, um, that is gone. And that was a function not of the high concentration of media institutions that were part of the 60s and 70s, but at least the idea of some gatekeeping when it came to information. And that gate gatekeeping is over. Um, and the reasons why 74 million voters can believe that the election was stolen when our whole system of determining facts about that involving the courts, for example, says that's not true, really has to do with the deg degrega degradation of these institutions, it seems to me. The nicer way to put it is the democratization of these institutions. Um, I, to go back to what Daryl said about um, uh, limiting what we hear, you know, I, I teach at Berkeley and um, I'm very aware of this phenomenon, but I also think, uh, right into the classroom, by the way, um, but I also think that, you know, it's like trying to uh, take a, a colander and pre prevent a flood. Do you know what I mean? In a larger society, the kind of rules that universities and other institutions are putting down uh, will not prevent QAnon. Uh, they will not prevent these enormous, you know, the rallies I talked about, Trump rallies, I, I have to add something about wearing a mask. Most people did, believed that COVID was a hoax. And these are not crazy people. These are people who have jobs and kids and kids going to college and all the rest of it. I met a nurse, I interviewed a nurse who, who treated COVID patients and believed that COVID as a national phenomenon was a hoax. Um, that would not have been possible uh, during the pandemic of 1918. Um, it is possible now. And it has to do, it seems to me, with what our institutions of information, I don't limit this to the New York Times or, or journalism institutions, but in a much broader sense, what they have become. If Daryl, if I could just very quickly um, um, respond. Um, so I, uh, Mark, I think that a careful discussion of this would reveal that there's more continuum than what has been said so far would suggest. Um, we had um, uh, in, in our lifetimes a candidacy for the presidency of a man named Barry Goldwater, which was based on, you know, wild um, uh, distortions of reality. Um, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, was opposed vehemently by uh, uh, broad sectors of society on the basis that he was a communist, um, uh, something which was never remotely factually true. Um, for most of my childhood, um, most of the, much of the country, especially in the deep south, uh, received, depended for much of its information on AM radio. Uh, and on AM radio in that era, um, Things every bit as woolly as what you find on the on the internet now uh, were being said. Ideas were being tr transmitted. Hatreds were being fomented. Myths were being perpetuated. Um, uh, so, um, you know, I share um, a sense of uh, alarm about where we've just come from over the last five years or so, and where that might suggest we're heading. But my, the difference is I don't think that the internet is the entire explanation for this and that we have, that we've experienced an order of magnitude change yet. I think that to, to believe that requires ignoring or downplaying uh, a lot of stuff in the past. Um, the other thing I would say, I'm sorry to go on here, but is that you have to be careful, not you, Mark, anyone, having this discussion has to be careful what they would wish for. So I am very happy that Twitter blocked Trump at the moment that it blocked Trump. Uh, 
be, not because I take infringements on freedom of speech, speech lightly, uh, and be, nor because I think that uh, such a, um, uh, a sanction should be applied widely or freely to anybody who says anything objectionable, but because Trump occupied the position that he occupied and was using uh, already the most he already had the most pop, most powerful platform in the world for disseminating his ideas without Twitter, and then was weaponizing Twitter for his explicit political purposes in the midst of a campaign. Um, so I thought that there was an urgent need to uh, to to withdraw that access to to Trump. However, um, if for for all of our alarm about the implications of this new era of a lack of shared truth or no gatekeepers. I have a great deal of trouble understanding on what principle basis one can begin to say, this person can speak, that person can't speak. This person can have a platform, that person can't have a platform. This can be uh, said in public, that can't be said in public. This can be printed, that can't be printed. I, I just don't know where you end up once you proceed down that path. I mean, That's right. just, can I have one brief thing? Um, I, I certainly wasn't proposing that path. In fact, I didn't propose anything. Um, I'm just saying that, you know, Barry Goldwater was not elected, he was crushed. And at the time, the greatest uh, uh, landslide in the history of the country. Uh, so the one candidate who you could cite as an extremist in the last 60 years uh, was completely destroyed. Trump was elected. Trump was elected and, uh, and governed, uh, if you'd like to call it that, uh, which is, if, if there's not uh, a difference in magnitude there, I don't know what a difference of magnitude is. So I'm not, I'm not making any argument about limitation of speech or anything else. I'm just saying this is, uh, or in, nor am I being nostalgic. I'm just saying that this is where we we are at the moment. Uh, we've gone from a kind of top-down society when it comes to information to a democratized one. And one of the consequences is you have a popular myth like QAnon suddenly having the allegiance of arguably tens of millions of people. And I think that's fairly predictable, uh, you know. Uh, did you want to say, Elizabeth or Justine? Yeah, I, I think um, I sort of agree with Howard. I, I grew up in Texas. I'm still tight with all my family down there. Uh, my husband's also from Texas. We met in high school. It's obviously a different life plan than a lot of colleagues. Um, and I mean, yeah, it was sort of always uh, sort of bizarre opinions uh, percolating down there. Uh, recently, uh, Agnes Caller, a philosopher at the University of Chicago, made a remark to me in conversation. She said, G.K. Chesterton uh, said, if you, if you uh, want to meet people who are not like you, I'm paraphrasing, live in a small town. Um, the, the meaning being, if you're actually in like a tiny tight enclave where you're forced into constant contact with other people, you're gonna get a true sense of how kind of nuts uh, people are and the just enormous variation and you know, not only things people think, but ways they go about acquiring thoughts, you know, different epistemologies, they vary hugely. The problem is that because the internet is what it is, no, no one lives in a small town. Everyone lives in this kind of uh, hive of, of constant communication. And, and within that, you can wall yourself off in an enclave of people who are kind of in the same zone as you are. There's, Social psychology tells us when a bunch of people who are like-minded get together, they polarize, they become even more entrenched. Their thoughts become even more extreme versions of what they had been before. That is what the internet enables. And I think the reason that it's running afoul of our sensibilities about free speech is because it's it, that you have to control forms of speech that threaten liberal democracy is priced into liberal democracy. It's priced into the idea of free speech. Right? This is uh, something Rawls goes on about at length, right? Yeah, you, you can't just allow unfettered promotion of, of speech in a liberal democracy that's inimical to liberal democracy itself, or else you face the dissolution of liberal democracy. 
Um, and at this point, we just don't have any way of preventing that. And the nature of the internet itself kind of encourages it um, because it's going to create these enclaves of people with ever escalating, ever more extreme um, ways of thinking and, and views. Um, now, is it concerning? I suppose. Um, I think letting everybody in the world talk to each other simultaneously was never going to turn out good, right? That's the Tower of Babel. Um, people should not. Uh, I think there's too much togetherness. I think that's a possibility. Um, and, and this kind of uh, strange psychology and the, the just vast polarization um, of public discourse is, is why I think that happens. It's hard to even describe a center anymore. Um, there are people who can remember it, um, but I, I'm not even sure what I would politically describe as a center. Even if Biden situates himself that way, it seems like he's referring to something in the past. Yeah. Um, and maybe that's a, a, a stopgap for the moment. Maybe this can be decelerated. I'm not sure how, but I think it's a matter of, of technology catching up with liberal democracy in a way that was always going to hit us at some point. Justine? No, I, I feel like a student here. I, I, um, no, I think these are the, the central tensions, <laughs> you know, that the, the crisis of journalism, journalism at the time of crisis, these are the central tensions. Everyone has um, said them better than I, I possibly could. It, it is, it's, it's disinformation. It's, it, you know, the proliferation of false ideas versus the fact that who were who were the gatekeepers to begin with? What information were we getting before, and and who were these you know arbitrary people? I mean, I think we know who they were and who they've always been, and 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 so yeah, I I I, I agree with everyone, I suppose, um, <laughs> and 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 I and I'm really interested also in Liz's idea that right, it, it's a hopeful idea certainly, um, or maybe it's a resigned idea, but that that. Right, perhaps technology will just have to catch up to this chaotic time. Um. I wonder how much of, uh, I mean, Tocqueville, he talks about, uh, Tocqueville, Tocqueville. Um, new, two kinds of newspapers. One is for information and the other is an organizing tool, a much more like a sort of club. And so there are these aggregates that have always been with us or people seeking a, a common, uh, a uh, common group or a place to belong. And I, I sort of think that uh, the attack uh, has come from, or our problems come from both sides, not just the right, but also the left or the people, that progressive side, that sort of cancellation, punitive side that uh, polices uh, culture as well. They've been sort of internalized this uh, um, polarization, shall we say, or something like that. Uh, um, I always thought the uh, free press was part of, yes, uh, liberal democracy, but our troubles to me seem to come from people sort of being confronted by what democracy working actually means. Uh, and uh, one of the things identity politics has done, I think, is to give us a white identity politics we haven't had since the 19th century and that we haven't needed to have because, I don't know, why it was the norm, the standard or something. But now there's this kind of um, very brittle, uh, fragile feeling of uh, being um, superseded or, um, or made one of many a loss of status that uh, a lot of people seem anxious about. Some said that uh, people voted for Trump not uh, because of race, but because of, uh, they just thought he'd make them richer, but the two are the same uh, in, in my mind. And we have Trump because we had Obama. Uh, maybe that's uh, simplistic, but I, I think the cost of democracy is shocking a lot of people, especially uh, in an era where uh, climate change and the idea of uh, finite resources uh, and how different the future is for the young now compared to what it was uh, when I was young. Uh, these are sort of traumas uh, to uh, American power. I like. Uh, uh, um, Elizabeth's idea that uh, there's too much togetherness. And the one thing about reading is that uh, it does uh, quiet everything around you. Um, one thing the internet 
did was sort of, I think, elevate uh, the short piece, the burst, uh, the block. Uh, and I sort of think that uh, uh, the moment gives a chance for uh, the longer form, since the book remains the only place where you can make a complicated argument. Uh, and in a lot of the journals uh, that you write for, uh, people used to write books by writing for them, for these journals first. So I think that um, if anything, uh, the current crisis had made of every journalist a kind of a writer of imaginative prose and the solutions you have to come up with and the, the stories uh, that you seek out and how you tell them. Um, I think the human element, uh, if it wins, then you know, everyone will be okay. Um, anyone else want to, before we go on to questions and answers from listeners? Do you have uh, other points you'd like to make? Uh, for instance, I think the um, Facebook oversight board that they propose is rather feeble uh, as an idea. I don't know why. I don't know. Well, I do know why, but Facebook pays for it. So. Anyone um, else? Comment? Darrell, I think you, 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 you raised some, some very fertile ideas that would take another two or three hours just to sort of begin to sort of chip away at the surface of um but but the this um uh emergence of white identity politics that you speak to i think is on the one hand uh, related to this precariousness or pre sense of precarity that you that you spoke to of you know the difference between the era of our youth and the era of young people today where um abundance doesn't seem to be the prevailing truth of life anymore. Opportunity doesn't seem to be, although opportunity was never equally shared, uh, opportunity for people, uh, for those people for whom it seemed reserved doesn't seem uh, so promising or full anymore. Um, that these, these are drivers of white identity politics that I think are fairly obvious. Another driver of white identity politics, I think, goes back to, excuse me, to return to this theme, but to the dem democratization that I invoked earlier, that white people didn't have to put up with black people saying stuff in the past, in public, getting on the air, being in print, uh, being heard, being seen. Um, and, and that itself is threatening. I'm talking about with the, 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 the volume or the, the, mm. the, the, the scale of audience that, or the readiness all, that can all be obtained today, right? In the past, that just didn't exist. So part of having gatekeepers was also the fact that the gatekeepers all sort of came from a very narrow social and racial set of identity backgrounds. Uh, and, and, you know, black people and many others were kept out of view almost all of the time, right? And so I think that the identity politics that you, white identity politics that you spoke to are also in a very real sense a, a, a reaction to that. That like, who are these people? Why are, why are they on my TV screen? Why do I have to hear about their issues? You know, let's get back to the real America. Uh, the real America being of course, that group of, uh, well, white people. Uh, I think that we're talking about a loss of shared culture or a sense of a sense of a shared culture. Mm -hmm. uh, so, are we ready for the Q and A? And so, a lot of, a lot. To, uh, yeah, we've you. got a lot of questions. I've tried to select a few that we haven't touched upon, um, and we'll see how many we can get through. So, um, one just on the theme of the panel: crisis privileges a certain kind of journalism. Uh, focused on immediate responses. Um, how does one link the immediate to long-term without the tenuous string being snapped and ending up in a balloon that spirals from crisis to crisis to crisis? Anyone? <laughs> I'm not quite sure I understand what the I, th I think that the question is, is getting at that right now we're in a state of, of journalism responding very quickly and suddenly to, to things that we deem as crisis. Um, and it does that feed into itself over and over. And is there any way to start, you know, separating that out of the Trump era, out of the January 6th riot and start 
you know, looking at more of a cohesive long-term larger picture journalism is my reading of that question. Someone? I think that's a great question. I mean, it's a, are we addicted to a very short attention span, short-term immediate sense of crisis that the cliche would have it was born of CNN and cable news, but which has been vastly accelerated by the internet and, and by the Trump administration um, and by his use of Twitter um, uh, and uh, you know a deliberate politique of outrage that he cultivated, right? Um, I don't know the answer to the question, but I think it's a very good question. I think uh, journalism, has, journalism has always had to follow or cover these things. The, the, the weird thing that happened under Trump is that with so many outrages uh, occurred on a daily basis, it was hard to keep them in mind. And mm -hmm. so if I saw a reference to something that had happened four months ago, I'd already forgotten it. Yeah. It's just sort of one after the other. So it's not that you got used to it, it's just that you couldn't, um, couldn't keep up. I mean, I think it functioned in large part as a distraction, right? Because if we knew, we knew, I mean, I, I remember feeling almost when he was, when his Twitter was shut down, that suddenly there was genuinely more space in the world. Um, I, I could almost physically feel it. And um, I remember kind of when I, I remember being in South Africa years ago and reading like a, about some really massive sort of government uh, scandal, but it was like on page six of the newspaper, you know, and I thought now so naively, how can such a thing be on page six of the newspaper? This would be front page, you know? Um, you know, we've lived with the most shocking scandals that would take down anyone happening every, you know, every twice a day. Um, for so long that it has, to me, you know, really functioned as a way to suck away there and act as a distraction, and and it 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 sets the playing field up differently. So what's what was once pressing is now almost irrelevant. Um, personally, I, I continue doing my long form journalism. I don't do you know crisis response journalism, but um, but certainly you, you can see the, the frantic energy that has been created by all of these, I mean, by all of these crises on top of each other has definitely taken the air from a room and it, it seems by design. Um, I'm not sure what the, the I, I can already tell that we have more space right now to tell other stories that maybe have been, have needed to be told. Yeah, there's a there's a great book by David Walsh and uh, the first few lines it's called the growth of the liberal soul and it says you know in one sense liberal theory and politics have always been in crisis um, I think that the post-war American experience of liberal democracy was atypical historically you just doesn't you don't see that uh, I think that the typical experience of liberalism is an experience of kind of just a revolving door of tumult, right? Uh, different governments get in there or governments don't form at all. Uh, you get these sort of grossly deadlocked uh, governments like the one that we're about to enjoy, it looks like. Um, and uh, you know, you get these wildly divergent uh, theories of, of the true and the good. And, and that leads to enormous conflicts. And, the, and, and that's no different than pre-modern or pre-liberal history. The question is just liberalism was supposed to be able to contain that without it you know, devolving into bloodshed. Would, would it be able to actually contain all of those tendencies um, non-violently? <clears throat> and, you know, sorta has been the answer. We did have a civil war. Uh, we have not always been able uh, to maintain our liberal democracy uh, non-violently. And, and many other uh, sort of insurrections and armed conflicts uh, besides uh, in the United States. I mean, you know, as recently as 1995, Timothy McVeigh bombed a federal building, killed 168 people. Um, that was, that was uh, you know, one of these moments where the question was, are we gonna be able to actually do this or not? Um, and we did, we pulled through it. 
Um, but but I think that this uh, that one of the problems right now is that the news has gotten so much. You know, the press has gotten so much better at covering the news. We know that people like to read about crises, um, and so there's uh, just a whole slew of incentives to cover these things. And, and very few arguments against covering them. It's what the press is supposed to do. And it's not like the press is less interested in muckraking now than it used to be. Um, so the question is how, how can we like train a citizenry uh, that's able to deal with this constant influx of information about crises without becoming so emotionally disaffected that they're barely able to kind of participate in the liberal democracy as citizens. And I don't know the answer to that question. I think um, a little bit of maybe news literacy, historical literacy, it's always been bad. It's always been a one crisis after another. Um, and, and the question is, can we hold it together? And our mission as a liberal democracy should be, if we can just get through tomorrow without everything degenerating into out and out chaos. That's a win for liberal democracy for the day. And I think that's the message that the press uh, should convey. I, I still do long form. Um, that's my preferred mode. And the idea that I always try to convey is just that, you know, the basic unit of this whole society is the human, the person. And they are a complicated universe unto themselves you can make no assumptions about, which I think is maybe the in my view, as best as I know, as best as I can tell, the right frame of mind for a citizen of a liberal democracy to maintain, which is ideas are what they are, parties what they are, but individuals, the, the very reason that we don't want to let this degenerate into violence, that the that the human life is extremely precious, um, still matter, must matter. And it's when you start losing that, that you really, you're looking at something like fascism. Um, I don't think we're there yet, hope not. I hope we're moving away from it. Um, but I think that's the shape of the problem as far as I can tell. It's interesting. I, I think that we're dividing into those who think things are different and those who think they were, they're the same. And I guess I'm uh, firmly would put myself down on uh, thinking things uh, of the last 10 to 15 years are decidedly different, uh, that we've got a degree of political degradation that the press is implicated in uh, that isn't, that is pretty much unprecedented. Um, that if you, I see history, I guess, uh, of liberal democracy, and certainly the US liberal democracy, very differently than Elizabeth just described. I mean, if you look at period, you know, the periods of the history of this country, we had long periods of Republican rule after the Civil War, long periods of Democratic rule after the New Deal. And then in the last 20 years, we've had an increasing degree of political shift back and forth, uh, an increasing degree of minority rule, um, uh, two elections in the last 20 years where the person who got the most votes did not get to the White House. It's the only time that's happened in so short a period. And if you look at the news cycle that, we, that was the basis of this question, I mean, Trump basically mastered the news cycle and showed that the commercial press, the idea that the press sits down, has editorial meetings and decides what's the news at the beginning of the day, was in a world in which eyeballs count the most, a fraud. That is that he determined what was being covered. He determined that his entire rallies would be covered. Why? Because they made the commercial press the most money. And, you know, that kind of news cycle uh, and its, its departure, I think, has left a kind of vacuum that is going to be filled by something. Uh, you know, people more, uh, people paid attention to politics in the last four years than I would venture to say ever in American history. Why? Because, because we had a reality TV star whose major talent, major brilliance was essentially reaching out, grabbing the press and making it do what he wanted. Why? Because they all wanted to make money. And I think that's a major change. I mean, we can talk about the history of journalism and partisanship and all these other things, 
but it seems to me that we're in a different world after Trump. Um, uh, yes, there's been violence in American history before, uh, but there has never been an election like this one where the almost the entirety of the opposing political party believes the winner is completely illegitimate, that they stole, stole the election. The closest you can compare it to is 1876, maybe, but at least there, there was a deal of some kind. I think we are in uncharted uh, territory. I think there's gonna be a lot of terrorism. I think we are in for a very different uh, polity than we've seen in the past. And um, I think the capital coup is just the beginning. Um, I think there are a lot of people who do not recognize the legitimacy uh, of this president, this regime, and you're going to be hearing from them. Um, I wish I didn't feel that way, but I do. Um, well, with any good panel, we're going to have only room for one more question. So let's go with this one. Um, to what degree is journalism to blame for its own delegitimization? Uh, it's not a secret that the profit motive has frequently interfered with major news organizations' willingness or ability to report all of the news, particularly with regard to international affairs or the shortcomings of capitalism. People aren't entirely wrong to suspect that the news sometimes isn't telling them everything. How can journalism confront this? Is it possible at all to confront it without excising the profit motive from the field? Um, so Mark, in a sense, answered some parts of that question in when he said that basically Trump mastered uh, the news media on the basis of its desire to make money. And that's absolutely true. Um, and, you know, uh, we're going to have to figure out how not to let that happen again, um, uh, if that's possible. Um, uh, I wish, you know, a platform like this could serve up an easy answer uh, to your question, but, but it, it's a very big question. Um, I, I, I'd take another piece of the question and say, I don't think that there's any such thing as all the news. Uh, there's no such thing as any, certainly no such thing as any organization that will ever serve up uh, even a remote approximation of what everybody will consider all the news. Um, and so that may be a vain wish that um, uh, news organization ABC or a to Z will satisfy every audience's definition of what all the news should be. Um, uh, I, I guess, you know, coming back, um, Mark, I appreciate, I don't, uh, I, I don't, I don't want this to, to the audience to, or, or you to feel that this is devolved in any way in a, in a, this side versus that side discussion here, because I certainly don't feel that way. But, um, you know, one of the interesting things about Trump and the way he figured out how to take advantage of, of the news media and the way you described is that, that this um, press um, sort of serving up its daily agenda or what it's, what's gonna be on page one or what's gonna be on the nightly news has always been driven first and foremost by what the president's day was like. That, that's always been the basic, the, the, the most basic ingredient. Right. Um, what is new is that Trump has um, is it, it, is the it, the rawness of it under Trump. That Trump had had has so had so it's hard to speak of him always in the past tense. Had so um, openly uh, exploited that uh, and sort of um, exploded the limits on the degree of dominance that a president could exert over. The, the news agenda of major major news organizations, and um, you know, I think that uh, Biden, uh, you know, who knows how his presidency is going to turn out. Uh, uh, but I think that one something that he's, I believe, he's consciously attempting to do is to ratchet that back down now. Like he, he could a, a, a very different style of politician could say, okay, this is the norm now. The president should be on the news all the time and whatever the president wants to have scheduled, he can figure out a way to get scheduled. I don't think maybe Biden's not capable, but he's not quote unquote talented enough to do that. But I don't think that's the problem. I think the, or the issue, I think the issue is Biden thinks that that's not the right, that that's not healthy and that we have to get back to 
some status quo ante, uh, if that's, I'm not actually sure if that's possible, whether, you know, um, uh, Hawley of Missouri, you know, will be the next Trump or there'll be a, some other candidate who emerges with the same kind of playbook that, you know, uh, will we'll try to, to, to run with the Trump playbook. Um, but, but the press hasn't figured out the answers to this um, viewer's uh, very big and provocative question. And, and this is sort of our homework for the whole society uh, in the next years. Um, I, I would say that I think, and obviously journalism as the institution is certainly not the enemy <laughs> in, in any way, but I, I think that it's something I think about a lot in terms of what stories have been centered, what stories we've given space to, whose perspectives have been valued. Um, and, and I think historically, be, because marginalized people, because journalism as an institution has followed the makeup of our institutions, um, one thing that I that I kind of notice shifting is that, you know, um, more black people are getting promoted, are getting put in places of power and more women. Um, and I, I think that there's been sort of a recognition that perhaps if these people's voices had been listened to a little bit earlier, if they're very valid perspective, um, if they're, what they saw happening um, had been accepted more widely um, by kind of those gatekeepers, that maybe we wouldn't have um, gone along for the ride as long as we went along for it, I think. Um, so to inject a little bit of positivity, I mean, there, there is a, a significant shift there, I think, that we're seeing whether or not that will, you know, continue on and be something that, that, um, that then trickles down into the kind of information that we're getting um, remains to be seen, but but if I think New York Magazine has a, a story right now on the new faces of publishing. This is the faces of black women now put in power. How is that gonna change, you know, and journalism, how will that change um, certainly what we are getting um, if our gatekeepers are different? I, I think journalism may have failed in part because the gatekeepers that we, but that we, allowed to stay in power or who, who stayed in power or were, were part of an institution and weren't seeing what, what a lot of people on the ground kind of kept or, or were being told that but were denying it, it maybe to make money for whatever reason. So just a little bit of hope for the future. Um, <laughs> uh, that's, that's one thing that I, that I have noticed happening quite recently. Generational change is never without some pain to someone. Um, but uh, talking about the journalism that is still at bottom a commercial venture, we must keep in mind that 37% of the workforce, never mind the kind of work they're doing, are millennials or Gen Z. So the stories they're interested in will become more important, which I think uh, fits with what you're talking about, the um, uh, changes uh, within uh, a lot of these uh, um, journalistic, uh, journalism, newspapers and stations, et cetera. I don't know what to call them, the press. So, um, Al? All right, um, any last thoughts on that question? I don't wanna jump in with, uh, um, okay. Uh, that will wrap us up for the evening. Um, thanks for, for sticking around with us. Um, thank you again to Justine, Howard, Elizabeth and Mark. Uh, and of course, Daryl, for joining us tonight um, for this panel. Host. Wonderful to hear. Uh, I know we talk about them as journalists, but they are first to me writers. So. I mean, I don't know why I make the distinction, but you know what I'm trying to say. They're really good journalists. Um, and uh, as, as mentioned at the start, um, before we leave, because once we leave, everyone's gone, I'm just gonna post one more time in the chat, this special offer for the NYRB. Um, my copy is gonna expire, so I'm gonna use it tonight. Um, otherwise, again, uh, everyone, um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, panelists. Um, and uh, uh, we will see you. Everyone be well, be safe. Yes. Thank, thank you, Hal. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, everyone. Thank All you, Daryl. Thanks, everybody. It was fun. Really nice was. to see you. And thanks for the positivity at the end. We needed <laughs> that. That was a great way to buckle it.
Yeah. <laughs> Good night, everybody.